Hello and welcome to this lecture on the chi-square statistic and measures of association. After this lecture, students should be able to calculate and interpret a test for the bivariate relationship between nominal and ordinal variables, determine the significance of a chi-square test statistic, explain the concept of proportional reduction of error or PRE, and apply and interpret measures of association lambda, Kramer's v, gamma, and Kendall's tau b. So a chi-square test is a statistical test designed to test for statistically significant relationships between two variables organized in a bivariate table, so following up from what we did last week. It requires no assumptions about the population distribu distribution and only works on categorical data, nominal, ordinal, or some sort of grouped interval ratio data. The chi-square test tests for statistical independence, in other words, to see if the two variables we are looking at are not associated or correlated. If two variables are statistically independent, then the percentage distribution of cases within a category will be identical. What this means is that the dependent variable will not differ between the categories of the independent variable. So when we are using chi-square, we do have some assumptions we need to make. First, we don't have any assumptions about the population distribution. However, we do assume random sampling, and we are assuming that we have categorical variables. We also have our research and null hypothesis. Our research hypothesis is that the two variables we have are related in the population, that they are associated in the population. Our null hypothesis, however, is that the two variables are not related or have no association. To compute our chi-square, we first need to compute our cell frequencies. So the first thing we have to do is determine the expected versus observed frequencies for each cell in the bivariate table. So to compute our expected frequencies, we're going to take the column marginal total multiply it times the row marginal total and divide it by the n for each cell. And this will get us the expected frequencies if no relationship between the variables is present. If this data is randomly distributed, then this is what that expected frequency would be. And then we're going to compare this expected frequency to the observed frequency or the actual frequencies that we've uh, measured in each cell. And so here's an example. This f sub 0 is going to be our observed, or f sub o is going to be our observed, and it's the actual data we've collected. And so here we have the observed and expected frequencies of men and women who are first generation college students. We see that our observed frequency of first generation college students is 691, non first is 1259. Here's our observed frequencies for women, and our expected frequencies, what we'd expect if there was no association between sex and generational status, first versus non-first generational students, this is what we would expect. And so this is calculated, these expected frequencies are calculated by taking this uh, row marginal times this column marginal divided by our total here of n and that will get us 817. We've done the same here for women. If we want to know our expected frequencies for women who are non-first generation students, we'd multiply 2684 times 2670 and divide it by 4620. So taking our, for each cell, we're taking the uh, row marginal times the column marginal divided by the total number of cases in this study. Once we've calculated these observed and expected frequencies, then we can start to calculate our chi-square. And so our chi-square is going to be equal to the sum of our observed frequencies minus our expected squared. So for each cell we're going to take our observed, subtract our expected, square it, and then we're going to divide that by the expected frequency. And then for each cell we will subtract the observed value from the expected, square it and divide it by the expected frequency and then add all these 
values together for each cell. And this can get quite complicated if we're going to do it by hand, and so later on in another video I'll demonstrate how to do that using Excel. But for now let's look at how uh, your book has done it. Your book has started out with the observed frequencies for each category, men first generation, men non first generation, women first generation, women non first generation. We have the observed frequencies here. They've shown us their calculated expected frequencies. They've shown us our observed minus our expected here. And then they've done that squaring for us. And then they've done this final calculation where they take this observed minus expected squared divided by the expected and given us these values here. And then they've added these all up to get 58. And so our chi-squared statistic for here is going to be 58. And this is how I suggest you calculate this by hand. Create a table listing the observed, then listing the expected, then listing the observed minus the expected, the observed minus the expected squared, and then the final observed minus expected squared divided by the expected. This will make it easier to keep straight what you're doing and make it so that you have less errors in your final calculation. The next thing we're going to do is calculate our degrees of freedom. And here we have a bunch of distributions that show what our distribution is going to look like for each degree of freedom. And you can see that as our degrees of freedom get larger, we start to approach a more normal distribution. So we'll need to keep that in mind as we go along here. When we're calculating the degrees of freedom, uh, we're going to use a formula of the rho minus 1 times the column minus 1. So the degrees of freedom is going to be equal to the number of rows, number of categories of our dependent variable, minus 1 times the number of columns, minus 1. So the times the number of categories in our independent variable, minus 1. And so our marginal table from our example had two columns and two rows, right? Men, women, and uh, non-first versus first generation. And so that means we're going to have 2 minus 1 times 2 minus 1, which is going to give us a degrees of freedom as 1. What essentially this means is degrees of freedom is the same as the number of cells that are free to vary if one cell is known. So if we know the frequency of one cell, then there's only one other cell that we uh, don't know that can still vary based on the row and column marginal totals. So here's a table that, I, that will look very similar to the one in the back of your book. So taking our degrees of freedom, we look in our appendix here using our appropriate degrees of freedom as well as our appropriate alpha value, the desired alpha value. So say we chose 0.05, we can look at 0.05 here, look at our degrees of freedom, which was one for this example. We see that we have a uh, you know, chi-square statistic or chi-square critical value of 3.841 compared to our chi-square calculated value of 58 we have statistical significance because our calculated value is higher than the statistic in our table or the critical value in our table. So chi-square gives us whether a relationship exists or not. It can tell us is there a relationship between these two variables or not. It can tell us the statistical significance of that relationship. However, it does not give us a strength of relationship. How much is the independent variable affecting the dependent variable. And so it also does not give us the direction of that relationship. Is the independent variable having a positive or a negative impact on the dependent variable? And so while we can tell with a chi-square statistic if we have a relationship or not, it does not tell us how much of an impact that relationship has or the direction. In addition, that chi-square is very sensitive to sample size, so larger samples are going to give us significance even if the strength of the relationship is really, really low. So as I mentioned earlier, chi-square only tells us if a relationship exists or not. 
And in order to get the strength and direction, we need to use what are called measures of association, which are a single summarizing value that reflects the strength of a relationship and sometimes the direction. The strength of a relationship indicates the usefulness of predicting the dependent variable from the independent variable. So how much of our dependent variable are we explaining with our independent variable? And the main one that we see is called proportional reduction of error. The proportional reduction of error, or PRE, is a measure that tells us how much we can improve predicting the value of, the, of a dependent variable based on the information we have about the independent variable. Basically, how much of the changes in the dependent variable are due to the independent variable. All the measures of association that we're going to discuss are based on this PRE. The conceptual formula for PRE is E1 minus E2 divided by E1, where E1 is equal to the errors of prediction made when the independent variable is ignored or not used. This is called prediction 1. And E2 is equal to the errors of prediction when the prediction includes the independent variable. This is called prediction 2. All PRE measures are based on comparing predictive error levels that result from these two methods of prediction, are E1 and E2, including the independent variable or not including the independent variable. In general, PRE ranges from 0 to plus or minus 1, with 0 being no association and plus or minus 1 being a perfect positive or negative association between the variables, respectively. A plus or minus 1 would indicate that we could perfectly predict our dependent variable from our independent variable. So let's look at an example here. First off, our independent variable here is degree or level of education of some kind, and our dependent variable is support for abortion. And so the first thing we're going to do is calculate our E sub 1, or in this case, the total N for our sample, which is 967, minus the modal category of the dependent variable. So if we look at our dependent variable here, we can see in the total here that support for abortion no is the modal category. So for the dependent variable support for abortion, no is our modal category. So that means that our E1, again, this is the total error or predicted error if we are not including our independent variable, is going to be 967, our total n, minus the modal category of our dependent variable, which is 500. 500 is larger than 467. And so that's going to give us a E sub 1, or our prediction 1, and total error of 467. These are the number of people who aren't in that modal category. Next we need to calculate our E2. In this case we're going to add up all the non-modal categories of the dependent variable based on our independent variable. So in this case it's going to look a little different. We're going to take the non-modal category for bachelor's or higher, which is going to be 129. So most people with a bachelor's degree chose yes whereas most, most people without a bachelor's degree chose no. And so we're going to take the non-modal categories for bachelor's or more and the non-modal category for yes, add those together, and we get a total of 413. These are the number of people that wouldn't fall into our prediction if we were to predict our dependent variable support for abortion based on someone's level of education. So the next thing we do is we need to plug this in. So we're going to get 467, our E1, minus 413, our E2, divided by 467, and we get 0.12. And this is showing a weak but positive association between education, or you know, less than a bachelor's and bachelor's or more, and support for abortion. So we should, can say that if you have a bachelor's or more, you are more likely to support abortion. But what this is really saying is that we could improve our prediction 
for if someone is going to support abortion by about 12% if we include whether or not someone has a bachelor's degree. Our next calculation that we're going to talk about, our next measure of association, is lambda. Lambda is an asymmetrical measure of association suitable for use with nominal variables and may range from 0 to 1. It only provides us with the strength of association. It does not give us direction. An asymmetrical measure of association is a measure whose value may vary depending on which variable is considered the independent variable and which is considered the dependent variable. And here we have the formula. Lambda is going to be equal to E1 minus E2 divided by E1. Same formula as the proportional reduction of error because this is a type of proportional reduction in error but with a slight change. In this case, E1 is going to be equal to R n, again our total, minus the modal frequency of the dependent variable, and E2 is going to be the total for the category minus the mode for the category, where k is the categories of the independent variable. So I'll show you what this looks like. So here we have a new table, some new data. We're looking at uh, Latinx ethnic identity as the independent variable, and whether or not they are first generation college student as our dependent variable. We got our formula for lambda up here. Let's take a look. So the first thing we're going to do is calculate our E1, which is going to be equal to our N, which is 241, minus the modal frequency for our dependent variable, which is non-first generation, of 132. And so we end up with 241 minus 132 is equal to 109. So that's going to be our E1. Our E2 is going to be equal to the n for each category of our independent variable minus the mode for that independent variable category. And so for Latin X students, we're going to take the total for that category, which is 87, minus the mode for that category, which is 55, shown here in the red. And we're going to add that to the n for non Latin X minus the mode for non-Latinx. And so we're going to end up with 32 plus 54. So 87 minus 55 plus 154 minus 100. 32 plus 54 is going to be 86. That is going to be our E2. Next, we will do our calculation, and we end up with 0 0.21. 109 minus 86 divided by 109 is going to be equal to 0 0.21. And so by using our student's Latinx identity, we can reduce our prediction error by 21%. Next we have Kramer's V. Kramer's V is a chi-square related measure of association for nominal variables. Kramer's V is based on the value of chi-square and ranges from 0 to 1. So again, does not measure direction, only strength. And it's going to be equal to the square root of our chi-squared divided by n times m, where m is the smaller of r minus 1 or c minus 1. So pretty straightforward. I'm not going to demonstrate this. If you have any questions about it, you can ask me during class. Here are a couple other measures of association that you might encounter. The first is gamma. Gamma is a symmetrical measure of association suitable for use with ordinal variables or dichotomous nominal variables. It can vary from 0 to plus or minus 1 and provides both strength and direction of association. Kendall's tau b is again a symmetrical measure of association suitable for ordinal variables only. Unlike gamma, it accounts for pairs tied on the independent and dependent variable. It can vary from 0 to plus or minus 1 and provides with both strength and direction of association. These symmetrical measures of association are measures of association where the value will be the same when either variable is considered the independent or dependent variable. Thank you. That is all for this lecture. Bye.